Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today we are going to look at Jehu and Jezebel. And so some background on that is that Ahab is the king of Israel and Ben-Hadad is coming against him. So God declares to Ahab that the army will be delivered into his hands. But Ahab ultimately makes a treaty with Ben-Hadad instead. And in 1 Kings 20, 42, it says, And the prophet said to the king, This is what the Lord says. Because you have let slip from your hand the man I have devoted to destruction, your life will be exchanged for his life and your people for his people. So then fast forward, Ahab wants to wants Naboth's inheritance. He, he has a field next to his house. And Naboth, of course, refuses to give up his inheritance. And so now Ahab is sulking because he cannot have the field. So in runs Jezebel, wanting to know why, you know, what she can do. So she sets out to plot a scheme and has Naboth killed, which is shedding innocent blood in the land, bringing the guilt of bloodshed, according to Deuteronomy 19.10. The Lord pronounces guilt upon Ahab, saying in 1 Kings 21, 20 through 24, when Elijah arrived, Ahab said to him, So you have found me out, my enemy. He replied, I have found you out because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is what the Lord says. I will bring calamity on you and consume your descendants. I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both slave and free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like that of Basha, son of Ahijah. Ahijah, if I can speak today. Ahijah. Because you have provoked my anger and caused Israel to sin. And the Lord also speaks concerning Jezebel, saying that the dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city will be eaten by dogs. And anyone <clears throat> in the, who dies in the field will be eaten by the birds of the air. And the Lord allows a lying spirit to be put into the mouths of all of Ahab's prophets, convincing him to go to a battle that that brings to pass in uh, his death. And in First Kings 22, 37 through 33, where it says, so the king died and was brought to Samaria where they buried him. And the chariot was washed at the pool of Samaria where the prostitutes bathed. And the dogs licked up Ahab's blood, according to the word of the Lord that the Lord had spoken. The word against Jezebel and the rest of Ahab's family is now left to be accomplished. So enter Jehu. So Elijah is told in 1 Kings 19, 16 and 17. You are also to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, son of Shaphat from Abel Mehola, to succeed you as prophet. Then Jehu will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. Jehu is announced king pretty much without any fanfare and is told in 1 Kings 9, 6 through 10. Uh, so Jehu got up and went into the house where the young prophet poured the oil on his head and declared, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people Israel, and you are to strike down the house of your master Ahab, so that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord shed by the hand of Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish, and I will cut off Ahab from Ahab every male, both slave and free, in Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the houses of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and Basha, son of Ahijah. And on the plot of ground at Jezreel, the dogs will devour Jezebel, and there will be no one to bury her. Then the young prophet opened the door and ran. So Jehu sets off towards Jezreel. On his way, he kills Jehoram, who is the son of Ahab, as well as Ahaziah, who is another relative of Ahab's. Jehu has the eunuchs throw Jezebel from the window. She dies. 
Later, he wants to bury her because she is the daughter of a king. So they they go out to find her body, but all that's left is her skull and her hands. And that is recorded in 2 Kings 9, 36 and 37, where it says, So they went back and told Jehu, who replied, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the ground, plot of ground at Jezreel, the dogs will devour the flesh of Jezebel, and Jezebel's body will be like dung in the field on the plot of ground at Jezreel, so that no one can say, this is Jezebel. So then he moves on to deal with the 70 sons of Ahab, having the priest uh, that were caring for them to cut off their heads, striking down all of those who were affiliated with Ahab and then goes after the worshipers of Baal. Now, this is the point where most advocates of Jehu stop. He killed Jezebel, destroyed the temple of Baal. So he's the hero. And multitudes of prophecies have been declared recently about the great Jehu and how we need a spirit to be raised up against the tyranny of our governments and put an end to this Jezebel and false god worship. So let's rewind a little bit and read what Jehu said in 2 Kings 9.22. He said, how can there be peace? He replied, as long as the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel around. Now, he was aware of Jezebel's idolatry, which is fornication, in that she turned from God to another God, whoredom, harlotry, it's adultery against God, and her witchcraft, which is sorcery. But in 2 Kings 10, 29, it says, But he did not turn away from the sins that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had caused Israel to commit, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. The ten tribes given to Jeroboam the Ephraimite became the northern kingdom of Israel. You can find that in 1 Kings 11, 26 through 43. Jeroboam was a leader, a king, that did not want people to turn back to the Lord. So he made images to be worshipped. Two calves of gold telling people that it was too hard for them to go to Jerusalem. So they should worship these calves as the God who brought them out of Egypt. And the Lord said in 1 Kings 14, 10 through 11, I will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both slave and free in Israel. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns up dung until it is gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city will be eaten by dogs and anyone who dies in the field will be eaten by the birds of the air for the Lord has spoken. Same thing as Jehu was told. I mean, Ahab about Jehu was told that about it. (laughs) Ahab. (laughs) So we could see that Jehu himself was steeped in idolatry. He was not careful to follow the Lord, refusing to turn away from his own idolatry, even though he was claiming zeal for the Lord. Now, some speak of Jezebel's idolatry as if it was more evil than all others. And I would counter that with the fact that Jehu knew the word of God. He he knew idolatry was prohibited and he did it anyway. 2 Kings 10, 32 and 33 says, In those days, the Lord began to reduce the size of Israel. Haziel, the king of Syria, defeated the Israelites throughout their territory from the Jordan eastward through all the land of Gilead, the region of Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh, and from Aor by the Arnon Valley through Gilead to Bashan. Haziel was anointed king by God in 1 Kings 19.15, and when Elijah anointed him, he wept for he saw the evil that Haziel would do to the Israelites in 2 Kings 8, 7 through 15. And in fact, God told Hosea in 1, 4, when he's talking to him about naming his son, he says, name him Jezreel, for soon I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will put an end to the king, kingdom of Israel. So it is evident that God used Jehu to perform his words spoken against Ahab. But does this make Jehu a person to be extolled? Jehu has been referred to as a 
real man of God. But where does scripture call him this? How can an idolater be called such? Jehu conspired against Ahab, which is exactly what Basha did against Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, striking down the whole of Jeroboam's house in 1 Kings 15, 25 through 30. This was according to the word of the Lord in 1 Kings 14, 10. The king of Syria, Haziel, was included in the word of the Lord to Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 15 through 17 for what would be accomplished by them. So was Haziel a real man of God for accomplishing God's word? Certainly not. God said in 1 Kings 14, 7 through 9, Go tell Jeroboam that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I raised you up from among the people and appointed you ruler over my people, Israel. I tore my kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. But you were not like my servant, David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all of his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. You have done more evil than all who came before you. You have proceeded to make for yourself other gods and molten images to provoke me, and you have flung me behind your back. He said he would cut off the house of Jeroboam for the idolatry of the golden calves, and that anyone belonging to him who dies in the city would be eaten by dogs, and anyone who dies in the field would be eaten by the birds of the air. Again, this is the same message repeated to Basha and Ahab for the same sins. 1 Kings 14.14 14 says, Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day, yes, even today. So does this mean Basha, Haziel, Jehu, are these people to be looked up to? No. God uses people and things for his purpose throughout scripture, but this does not make them godly. Pharaoh was not godly. 2 Timothy 2, 19 through 21 says, Nevertheless, God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord must turn away from iniquity. A large house contains not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. And some indeed are for honorable use, but others are for common use. So if anyone cleanses himself of what is unfit, he is a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, and prepared for every good work. Jehu did not turn from his iniquity, but he was a vessel of dishonor, used of God for his purpose. There is a repeated theme throughout the Bible, but Ezekiel 33, 13 through 16 tells us in plain words, if I tell the righteous man that he will surely live, but then he trusts in his righteousness and commits iniquity, then none of his righteous works will be remembered. He will die because of the iniquity that he has committed. But if I tell the wicked man, you will surely die, and he turns from his sin and does what is just and right if he restores a pledge, makes restitution for what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without practicing iniquity, then he shall surely live. He will not die. None of the sins he has committed will be held against him, because he has done what is just and right. He will surely live. Jehu prophecies are almost always focused on him killing Jezebel and how we need to rid her spirit from operating. Scripture says that Jezebel wrote letters in Ahab's name to have Naboth killed, 1 Kings 21, 8 through 16, so that Ahab could claim his inheritance. Although God does deal with Jezebel, he holds Ahab accountable for this action. 1 Kings 21, 17 through 9. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite, saying, Get up and go down, meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. See, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, of which he is gone to take possession. Tell him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his land? Then tell him this, that this is also what the Lord says. In the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, 
There also will the dogs lick up your blood. Yes, yours. And following in verse 23, it says, And the Lord also speaks concerning Jezebel. The dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Jehu did not kill Jezebel. It was her own eunuchs that threw her out the window so the dogs could eat her. But this is to fulfill the word of the Lord. The whole story is about God ridding Israel of Ahab and his associates, the idolaters. And it was God himself that brought these things to pass. It was meant to bring glory to God, not the people that were used to perform it. People are said to be manifesting a Jezebel spirit when they are seeking control, acting dominating or manipulative, attempting to assassinate character when they're angry, murderous, that these people are attracted to intelligent and high ranking people seeking to be the center of attention, causes strife, mocks, hates authority, despises correction, is prideful, independent and rebellious. There are literally teachings galore on this. All you have to do is put it in your Google search. <clears throat> so now we're going to read Galatians 5, 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, discord, jealousy, rage, rivalries, divisions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So now we're going to expound on those and give definitions. Sexual immorality, sex outside of marriage, but it's ultimately adultery towards God. Impurity is adulterated with a wrong mix, tainted by sin. Debauchery. Spite, which rejects restraint and indulges in pride or haughtiness, manifested in contemptuous and overbearing treatment of others. Idolatry, image worship, whether it represents the form of an object, either real or imaginary. Sorcery, a pharmacist practitioner who mixes up distorted religious potions, like a sorcerer, magician, which is rebellion to God. Weaving illusions about the Christian life to use religious formulas that manipulate the Lord. This has a drugging effect on the aspiring religious zealot, inducing them to not operate in keeping with scripture. Hatred is hostility. Discord is quarrel, strife, a readiness to quarrel, having a contentious spirit, affection for dispute. Jealousy, burning emotion, rage is wrath. Rivalries, the seeking of followers and adherents by means of manipulation, which is controlling someone or something, acting for one's own gain and bringing strife. Factions are disunion. Envy, it's a trait of being glad when someone experiences misfortune or pain, displeasure at another's good. So are we getting the picture here? What is being described as a Jezebel spirit is actually what the Bible calls acting in the flesh. So no matter how often you would command this spirit to leave, it would not because it's not a spirit in the first place. It's the flesh showing itself and we are commanded to put to death the flesh and only we have the ability to kill our own flesh. When Jesus confronted unclean spirits, which are fallen angels, not spirits of mankind, they were described as those who caused physical conditions, convulsing, inability to speak, inability to hear, causing self-harm, torment. So I'm, I'm not teaching about demonic activities here. Rather, I'm just pointing out that there's a host of teachings on this subject, and they have clearly gone well beyond the boundaries of Scripture. By describing the doings and the actions as a spirit instead of the flesh, boy, it just lets us right off the hook, doesn't it? We have no responsibility for our own actions. 
And crowds of people have been convinced that they have a demon when the simple truth of the matter is that they love to indulge their flesh. That is that they love their sin more than they love obeying God. So where does scripture indicate that Jezebel was influenced by demonic spirits or that her spirit lives on and that we need to confront it? And in fact, where in all of scripture does it say that a human being that has died can become an evil spirit that lives on and materialize itself? Nowhere. Yet books, books abound about this teaching. And the fruit of that is the riches to the author and the reader led into error, still bound up in their sin. And I'm not saying that there are no demonic forces that need to be dealt with, but erroneously calling works of the flesh a spirit is mixing a distorted religious potion. And people heap up these teachings because the burden of correcting the problem is not on them. Because the devil made me do it. Now, Elijah, Elisha asked Elijah to inherit a double portion of spirit in 2 Kings 2, 9. Elijah was a man, part of mankind, just like us, according to James 15, 17. So Elisha was not asking for a double portion of Elijah's human spirit. When Moses was leading the people, he went to the Lord and said the burden was too great for him to bear by himself. So in Numbers eleven sixteen and 17, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of the elders of Israel known to you as leaders and officers of the people. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them stand there with you. And I will come down and speak with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you and Put that spirit on them and they will help bear the burden of the people so that you do not have to bear it by yourself. Elijah was, Elisha, excuse me, was asking for a double portion of the spirit of God. It's as the word of the Lord came to Elijah, he in turn was a vessel for honor. He was faithful to speak it and do it. It was not in his power to give this spirit given to him, to Elisha. It is God who gives the spirit. So Jezebel is stated to be only afraid of the prophetic. Again, where, where does scripture state this? It does not. She did kill the prophets, but there's no record of that event. She is blamed for leading the nation into idolatry, but this is false because Jeroboam had already done that. What seems to be forgotten is that the king is to be the leader of the people, tearing down false religious pillars, maintaining the temple repairs, and leading people to serve God. Those that did this were right in the eyes of the Lord. Ahab was raised by an idolater who walked in the ways of Jeroboam. So they worshiped the golden calves and he set up the altar in the temple of Baal in 1 Kings 16. The continual idolatry began with Jeroboam and did not stop. And this happened years before Jer Jezebel was even born. Abijah was king of Judah at the time Jeroboam was king in Israel. And Abijah says to Jeroboam in 2 Chronicles 13.9, but did you not drive out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites? And did you not make priests for yourselves as do the people of other lands? Now, whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams can become a priest of things that are not God. God in his absolute mercy and faithfulness brought the prophets to them because they were the only people speaking the truth of his word. And history is repeating itself today. Today, all you have to do is call yourself a prophet. And poof, you're a prophet. People often say, well, 
I, I experienced in, in regards to these teachings. And to that I ask, do we think that those who follow false religions don't have experiences that confirm to them what, what they're doing is right? Why would they continue to practice those things if there was not some convincing experience that, that occurred to them in their own mind? We have this example in Jeremiah 44, 16 through 18, where it says, as for the word you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. Instead, we will do everything we vowed to do. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven and offer drink offerings to her just as we and our fathers, our kings and our officials did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. At that time, we had plenty of food and good things and we saw no disaster. But from the time we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been perishing by the sword and the famine. This was their experience. If they did things that they were taught by other people, you know, the, the leaders and the officials, <clears throat> even though they're not in line with the word of God, they had good experiences. So the response from God in verse 22 and 23 is, so the Lord could no longer endure the evil deeds and despicable acts you committed and your land became a desolation, a horror and an object of cursing without inhabitant as it is this day. Because you burned incense and sinned against the Lord and did not obey his voice, or walk in his instruction, his statutes, and his testimonies. This disaster has befallen you as you see today. And this is where we are headed as well. So if your experiences are not lining up with the word of God, then they are error regardless of the immediate results. And I know that there is a popular book that tells us that the Jezebel spirit is plotting to destroy our country. So again, there's no basis in scripture that shows us that a spirit destroys a country. It is always sin. It is the refusal to repent of that sin and do what God says, and it brings the judgment of God. Now, this book uses the story of Jezebel to liken it to us today in America that this Jezebel's spirit, although he admits it's not actually the Jezebel spirit, it behaves like her, but then reinforces that it is the Jezebel spirit. So it's really kind of confusing and talking out of both sides of his mouth. So the claim is here that the spirit is seeking to silence the voices of repentance, which he called the prophetic. And in this assertion is a great truth that is overlooked today by today's prophetic community. The true prophets of God always, always brought the message of repentance, returning to God and forsaking sin. Another wonderful piece that was brought forth is that we've bought the lie of the false gospel. You can have your Jesus and keep your sin. He loves you just the way you are, so indulge your flesh and live it up. It is upbeat messages concerned only with the cares of this world, that God is never displeased with us. And so we've either thrown completely out the Old Testament or we just dismiss the parts we don't like. And the message of repentance is hated. The pulpits are full of entertainers that speak messages that cater to its adherents. Fear of losing those adherents, especially those big tithers, is stated to be the reason. And I completely disagree with that. It's not fear. It's the fact that they have forsaken the truth is the reason. It's literal biblical history repeating itself. Jeremiah 5.31 is quoted in the book as the result of Christians engaged in sin. And it says, the prophets prophesy falsely 
and the priests rule by their own authority. And my people love it so. But what will you do in the end? And with this, I completely agree. But the whole of Jeremiah 5 is truly the crux of the issue. Speaking of how God's people are to come out of the pollution of sin, uh, he reminds us that friendship with the world is hatred towards God. And so America's sins are laid bare in the book. The idolatry, the sexual sin and perversion, human trafficking, abortion, gender confusion, feminism, so on. But how was this expounded on? By using worldly info. Quotes of those from false religions with, you know, a little bit of scripture thrown in here and there. We absolutely refuse to see the hypocrisy of our ways when it comes to this. We want one foot in the world and one in, in the other in God. God used the children of Israel to drive out the inhabitants of the land due to those inhabitants committing abominations against God. Now, the book tries to liken America to Israel in that we have a duty to rid our nation of sin, which is, again, going outside of the bounds of Scripture. What God said to the children of Israel in Judges 2 and 3 is still applicable today. So now I tell you, I will not drive out these people before you. They will be thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. Paul spoke about the thorn in his side and we turned it into some sort of demonic attack because he said a messenger of Satan was sent to him. Had this been a demonic attack, he would have used his authority in Christ to cast it out. No, what he told the Galatians is that he came to them because of an illness. And what that word illness means is a weakness, a sickness, referring to an ailment that deprives someone of enjoying or accomplishing what they would like to do. He asked the Lord to take it away and the Lord said his grace was sufficient for him. So Paul then goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, this is why for the sake of Christ, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If we had not completely thrown out the Old Testament, these things could be rightly comprehended. <clears throat> it is people who bring insults and persecutions, which means that it's referring to those seeking to punish God's messengers with a vengeance. These are some of the thorns in our sides. The world's God, which is their sin, they're, they're absolutely a snare to us. And instead of turning away from them, we just take scripture out of context, slap a Christian label on there, brought it right in the front door of the church. We look, talk, and act exactly like the world because of the error of the false gospel of have your Jesus and keep your sin. And we smell just like them to God, a burning stench of smoke that cannot be inhaled. How would it be possible to rid our nation of sin when the church itself worships another Jesus and a false gospel, which is literally the golden calves of idolatry for our day. The book states how we do this, how we bring down the Jezebel spirit or her behavior. We do this by pushing back against radical activism through the same means as the world in the flesh. Where is the example of Jesus confronting the Roman government's sin? Where, where was Peter, Paul, or any other apostles example of, of taking down the nations, the, the sins of a nation? It's, it's nowhere. But by making this claim, it ensures that we keep one foot in the world because it makes us our flesh happy and that we just, we're, we're doing something so noble. Were the children of Israel concerned 
about what other people were doing, other nations were doing? Sure. They sought a king to lead them instead of God in 1 Samuel 8. And is this not what the church is doing today? Let's elect this person. They can help turn our nation around. But this is making man our strength. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind, who makes the flesh his strength and turns his heart from the Lord. The example is repeated multiple times in the Bible. Ben-Hadad was supposed to be delivered into Ahab's hand, but instead Ahab made a treaty with him and got the punishment for that brought on himself in 1 Kings 20. King Asa was, you know, he started out doing right in the eyes of the Lord. And the prophet Obed came to him saying to him in 2 Chronicles 15, 2 through 4, so he went out to meet Asa and said to him, listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For many years, Israel has been without the true God, without a priest to instruct them and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord and the God of Israel sought <clears throat> and sought the Lord, and he was found by them. Oh, that we would hear those words. Years later, Basha comes against them, and Asa sends for help to Ben Hadad. In 2 Chronicles 16, 7 through 9, it says, At that time, Hananiah the seer came to King Asa of Judah and told him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans in a vast army with many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord are roaming to and fro all over the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. You have acted foolishly in this matter. So from now on, therefore, you will be at war. Now, this event ultimately turned Asa away from God to the point that it says in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet and his malady became increasingly severe. Yet even in his illness, he did not seek the Lord, but only the physicians. But it is only the Lord who is to be our strength, not an elected official, not a man, not a pastor, not a prophet, not any of this nonsense. It is to be God himself. Go read the Psalms. It says it over and over and over that the Lord was David's strength, God alone. If you don't like the sins of a nation, then you stop participating, full stop. Does this mean taking your kids out of schools, not using Facebook, not voting? If the church had lived by the standards of God, then the answer would be an emphatic, Yes, yes, and yes. The people love their sin. They love the convenience of it. Hating the truth. So instead, doctrines are made about the church conquering their sphere of influence because we are not going to let go of the cares of this world. Trusting in the strength of a political leader, that's the answer. It's, it's absolute idolatry. There's a reference to Jezebel in Revelation 2, who calls herself a prophetess and with leaps outside of the biblical text, they claim that this is the Jezebel spirit. Now, we've already said that this cannot possibly be the case, as we have already discovered there's no evidence of this anywhere in scripture. What we do have evidence for is people behaving like Jezebel in their flesh, 
Revelation 20, 2, 20 says, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants to be sexually immoral and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, this is being spoken about, about the church, not, not people in the world. <clears throat> It's we, the servants of God, that are tolerating her misleading teachings. It's, it's us. It's, it's not people in the world. Ahab's wife, Jezebel, killed the true prophets of the Lord. We already discussed that, but it's in 1 Kings 18, 4 through 13. She killed an innocent man of God in 1 Kings. Kings 21, 5 through 15. But again, it says Ahab is the one that God held accountable because he was the king. He was the leader of the people. 1 Kings 21, 25 through 26 says, Surely there was never one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord, incited by his wife Jezebel. He committed the most detestable acts by going after idols, just like the Amorites whom the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. Ahab was incited, which means allured, instigated, enticed, persuaded, provoked by Jezebel. So if this is the same Jezebel acting in her flesh, then the in Revelation 2, then she will allure, instigate, entice, persuade, and provoke the people of God to be sexually immoral, which is to fornicate, to be unfaithful to Christ. It is a form of idolatry and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Those teaching this Jezebel spirit doctrine use this scripture in Revelation 2 to describe people that are coming up against them in the world, but it's completely out of context. Let's understand what's being said here. The message is written to the angel, which means messenger of the church, the ecclesia, people called out from the world and to God. In Thyatira, Jesus says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches that she misleads my servants. So it is not written about or to people in the world. It is a group within the church that goes astray, gets off course, deviating from the correct path because that's the definition of misleads. So now I'm going to read the definition of trespass. It means fall away after being close beside a lapse, deviation from the truth, an error, a slip up, a wrong doing that can be unconscious and non-deliberate. This woman calls herself a prophetess, meaning that she declares the mind, the message of God, which sometimes predicts the future, a foretelling. It speaks forth his message for a particular situation. Again, this would not be something that the world could claim or do because they do not know God. But the church sure does have a bunch of self-appointed prophets running amok these days. She says she is bringing forth God's messages, but her teachings allure and entice the people of God into error, teaching them to eat things sacrificed to idols. Well, what are the people of God supposed to eat? The bread from heaven. Who is Jesus Christ, the living word of God, come in the flesh? This Jezebel speaks the word of God in harlotry, leading them straight into idolatry. And her fate is, behold, I will cast her onto a bed of sickness. And those who commit adultery with her will suffer great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Then I will strike her children dead and all the churches, churches will know that I am the one who searches the minds and hearts and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Those who commit adultery with her, those that continue to adhere to her teachings and errors will suffer great tribulation unless they repent. 
Her children are those born of her teachings who deviate from the correct path, roaming into error, being passive about being misled by her teachings. And if you've listened all the way through this message, then it should be recognized by now that this sounds exactly like the mainstream churchianity. It is not Christianity, it is churchianity. We are acting in rebellion to God. We refuse to repent and do things the way that God says. And by this, we do violence to his word and we are leading millions astray. We are those spoken of in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, that says, For if someone comes and proclaims a Jesus other than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or a different gospel than the one you accepted, you put up with it way too easily. Like Jehu, we acknowledge the Lord, but we are not going to give up our idolatry. It's why he's the hero being lifted up today, but we cannot recognize the plain truth of it. The flesh rules in the church in the same manner that it ruled Jezebel. It is the gospel of our day. And our end will be the same as theirs if we refuse to hear. The great delusion, that which is contrary to what God approves, that is made to cheat and deceive with a false impression, is promised to those who refuse to love the truth that would save them. God's righteous judgment comes on those who are not persuaded, not trusting in the truth of what God says, well pleased to do what seems right in their own eyes. It's violating God's standard. We must instead seek him in truth so that he will be found by us. And if we forsake him, he is going to forsake us. For many years, we have been without the one true God, without priests to instruct us and without the law. I pray that it is not in distress that we turn to the Lord, but out of our sincere love for him and for his truth, that he may be found by us. God bless you.